Welcome to Episode 10 of The Crisis, a day-by-day -day account of Britain's 1931 crisis brought to you 90 years on. What was the situation on the morning of the 24th of August, 1931? Just two days remained before the Bank of England's deadline, after which they believed a complete financial collapse was inevitable without the announcement of some program from the government to balance the budget. The night before, the Labour cabinet had agreed to resign, given nine of their number were not prepared to subscribe to a program of £76 million of public spending cuts, including a 10% cut in the rate of unemployment benefit, despite that same program appearing to promise a realistic prospect of securing a foreign loan. MacDonald had seen first the King, then the opposition leaders Baldwin, Samuel, and Chamberlain, and all had implored him to stay on as Prime Minister at the head of a three-party emergency coalition. He had gone to bed apparently intending to commit political suicide, resign as PM and party leader, and then vote for the package as an independent. He admitted, however, that he had not made up his mind. The Labour government was about to come to an end. The question remained, what would replace it to carry through the economy package, a conservative administration, or a national government? Around breakfast time, Ramsay MacDonald's son Malcolm rang Downing Street and talked to his sister Ishbel. The notes Malcolm made suggest his father had still not made up his mind about what to do. He wrote, quote, This is an awful decision for the PM to make. To break so with the Labour Party would be painful in the extreme. Yet JRM knows what the country needs and wants in this crisis, and it is a question whether it is not his duty to form a government representative of all three parties to tide over a few weeks till the danger of financial crash is past, and damn the consequences to himself after that. At 10 a.m., he arrived at Buckingham Palace for the conference of the three party leaders with King George V that the Labour cabinet had authorized the previous night to determine what type of government should come next. The King took firm control over proceedings. He had already made his preferences clear the previous day when he had seen each leader individually, insisting that MacDonald remain and that a national government be formed. MacDonald would probably not have joined such a government under Baldwin, but on the 23rd, the King had crucially boxed Baldwin into accepting accepting MacDonald's leadership. He now told MacDonald, the conservative Baldwin and the liberal Herbert Samuel, quote, Before they left the palace, some communique must be issued, which would no longer keep the country and the world in suspense. The prime minister said that he had the resignation of his cabinet in his pocket, but the king replied that he trusted that there was no question of the prime minister's resignation. The leaders of the three parties must get together and come to some arrangement. His majesty hoped that the prime minister with the colleagues who remained faithful to him would help in the formation of a national government, which the king was sure would be supported by the conservatives and the liberals. The king assured the prime minister that, remaining at his post, his position and reputation would be much more enhanced than if he surrendered the government of the country at such a crisis. Baldwin and Samuel said that they were willing to serve under the prime minister and render all help possible to carry on the government as a national emergency government until a bill or bills had been passed by parliament which would restore once more British credit and the confidence of foreigners. After that, they would expect his majesty to grant a dissolution. Thus, if MacDonald still had doubts, they were now dispelled by the king. As he had said, there was to be, quote, no question of MacDonald resigning. After 35 minutes, the monarch left the three politicians to iron out the details of the coalition and draw up a memorandum. He returned at 11.45 and was delighted to find the three party leaders in agreement, praising the fact that while other countries went weeks or months without governments, the British constitution allowed for political enemies to, quote, sink their own differences for a common good and arrange to meet one of the gravest crises that the British Empire had yet been asked to face. As the king had insisted, a communique was immediately issued to the press to inform the world, and crucially, foreign investors, that a new national government was being considered. The memorandum the three leaders had agreed on was as follow. 1. National government to be formed to deal with the present financial emergency. 2. It will not be a coalition in the ordinary sense of the term, but cooperation of individuals. 3. When the emergency is dealt with, the government's work will have finished and the parties will return to their ordinary position. 4. The economies and imports shall be equitable and shall generally follow the lines of the suggestions attached, designed to enable a loan to be raised in New York and Paris. 5. If there is any legislation which is necessary to pass for special departmental or other reasons and it is generally accepted by the different parties, it may be undertaken. And 6. 
the cabinet shall be reduced to a minimum. At 12 noon, MacDonald returned to Downing Street and met the Labour cabinet for the last time. Much has been written about this meeting and repeated ad nauseum by later historians that has transpired to be untrue or without evidence. Thus, many accounts say that MacDonald ditched the Labour government in favor of a national one. As we have seen, he tried every trick in the book to save the Labour government, and it was, in fact, the cabinet rebels who preferred that it leave office. The whole cabinet had unanimously agreed the previous night that the Labour administration must come to an end. It is said that the cabinet were stupefied, stunned, shocked, aghast when MacDonald told his colleagues that a national government would be formed. In fact, he had raised the possibility in cabinet two days before, and while most of his colleagues had opposed the idea, some had supported it. Regardless, it did not come out of the blue. While MacDonald had been at the palace, his chief opponent, Arthur Henderson, had confided in a colleague that he believed a three-party coalition the most likely outcome. It is also said that MacDonald asked each of his colleagues around the table to join him, and almost all refused or spoke out violently against the arrangement. There is in fact no record of this in the cabinet minutes, nor any dissent at all registered, which is normal practice, and at the conclusion of the meeting, a motion was passed unanimously which was recorded in the minutes as follows. Quote, the cabinet placed on record their warm appreciation of the great kindness, consideration, and courtesy invariably shown by the Prime Minister when presiding over their meetings and conducting the business of the cabinet, hardly the likely result of an acrimonious meeting. What did actually happen was that MacDonald explained what had happened at the palace and set out his reasons for agreeing to the king's proposal. That, in view of the gravity of the situation, he felt there was, quote, no other course open to him than to assist in the formation of a national government for the purpose of meeting the present emergency. Colonial Secretary Sidney Webb wrote, quote, He announced this very well, with great feeling, saying that he knew the cost, but could not refuse the king's request, that he would doubtless be denounced and ostracized, but could do no other. We uttered polite things, but accepted silently the accomplished fact. MacDonald set out to his colleagues the term of the memorandum the three leaders had agreed, describing how the government would be temporary, after which an election would be called and fought by each party separately. The new cabinet was to be a small emergency body of ten or twelve, rather like in wartime, and the new government would bring forward a package closely resembling the 76 million pounds of cuts that the cabinet had permitted be submitted to the New York bankers just two days before. At the end of the meeting, MacDonald asked three of his colleagues to stay behind, Philip Snowden, Jimmy Thomas, and Lord Sankey. Evidently, he was already thinking about the composition of the next cabinet. Given it was to be ten or twelve strong and composed of all three parties, there were to be four seats for Labour. He was, of course, staying on as PM. Snowden would have to remain as Chancellor, given this was a financial crisis. Thomas was his closest ally and strongest supporter in the cabinet, and Sankey, although something of a non-entity, was due to chair the crucial Indian Round Table Conference that was to take place in September. Thus, his retention made sense. It would have made no sense to invite the opponents of the economy package such as Henderson and Graham to join a government whose explicit purpose was to enact that very package. Equally, he could hardly have asked for more than four seats in a ten-man cabinet, given there was a hung parliament, and the fact the majority of the Labour Party would surely oppose the government's program. As the ministers left Downing Street, reporters asked for news on the new administration. J. H. Thomas simply replied, quote, I am in the cabinet, with one observer noting Riley that, quote, so far as Mr. Thomas is concerned, this is the most important news of the day. At 2.30 p.m., MacDonald met the outgoing junior ministers, the many ministers who were not of cabinet rank. The meeting had originally been arranged to inform the ministers of their coming pay cut. However, now the Prime Minister used the opportunity to explain the situation to a wider group of colleagues. He told them that in joining a national government, he was committing political suicide, and that he would not ask any of them to join him. However, he added, quote, perhaps some of us would be willing to travel the same road with him. The best plan will be for him to write to us individually and inquire. Some have criticized MacDonald's failure to try and recruit a wider labor following and thereby make the government more balanced. 
but his motive for not inviting many labor ministers to the new government may have been that he did not wish to fatally split the party he had spent his life building up. As we have seen, he considered joining the national government political suicide. The junior ministers were mostly younger and less experienced rising stars in the party such as Clement Attlee, Hugh Dalton, and Stafford Cripps. MacDonald therefore did not wish to ruin the careers of the next generation of labor leaders. Nevertheless, he appears in his private writings to have been hurt by the failure of so many colleagues and friends to support him. It has also been often reported that that afternoon, MacDonald said that, quote, Tomorrow, every duchess in London will be waiting to kiss me, a quote often cited as evidence of the labor leader's treachery. The only source for this is Chancellor Philip Snowden's autobiography, written several years later when Snowden had split from MacDonald and was making a concerted effort to ruin the latter's reputation and exonerate himself. Historian Reginald Bassett has argued it was a wry joke and that Snowden had previous for misreporting statements made in jest. Furthermore, all the other evidence that day is that MacDonald was morose and resigned about the formation of the national government rather than elated. His diary entry for the 24th is decidedly bitter and includes the interesting line, quote, The Chancellor was getting pessimistic as the desertions went on, and I tried to cheer him up, but indeed, it was a dreary matter. This could well refer to the joke MacDonald made, and indeed the actual passage from Snowden's autobiography, the context from which the quote is extracted, plays out rather like a setup and punchline, with a downcast Snowden commenting on the strange company they would now be keeping, and MacDonald responding with his Duchess line. Whatever the truth in the matter, it is clear MacDonald was anything but gleeful about splitting from the Labour Party. By the 25th, MacDonald had finalized his national cabinet in collaboration with Baldwin and Samuel. It was composed of ten ministers, four Labour, four Conservative, and two Liberal. We have already seen that four Labour men, Snowden, Thomas, Sankey, and MacDonald himself, sat in the cabinet as Chancellor of the Exchequer, Dominions and Colonial Secretary, Lord Chancellor, and PM, respectively. Another Labour cabinet minister, the Air Secretary, Lord Amory, remained in post, although the Air Force head no longer had the privilege of a cabinet seat. The Conservative leader, Stanley Baldwin, who had returned from France hoping to be PM again, was Lord President of the Council, a ceremonial post which effectively made him Deputy Prime Minister and Parliamentary Manager. The influential Neville Chamberlain returned to his former role as Health Minister, Sir Samuel Hoare was made India Secretary, and Sir Philip Cunliffe Lister became President of the Board of Trade. The Liberals, meanwhile, had done well. Although their leader David Lloyd George remained too unwell to play any active role, he had approved of his deputy Herbert Samuel joining the administration. Samuel took the post of Home Secretary, which he had held 15 years before, when the Esquithian Liberals had last been in office. Meanwhile, the respected and experienced Lord Redding became Foreign Secretary. There was less balance in the junior ministerial roles outside the cabinet, with 25 conservatives being appointed, 14 liberals, and just 5 labor, given the lack of manpower MacDonald could call on. For the time being, however, it was the emergency cabinet that mattered. They would decide the vital issues facing the nation. Given the government was only expected to last six weeks, the ministers were to essentially be departmental caretakers. The agreement the three leaders had put together said the new government wouldn't be handling any legislation other than balancing the budget and passing some bills already in progress. Events, however, would take several unexpected turns over the next six weeks. That meant the crisis was far from over, and the life of this most controversial of governments would turn out quite differently from that which was originally envisaged. Thanks so much for watching episode 10 of The Crisis. If you enjoyed it, then consider dropping a like because it really helps us out, and if you're not already, then consider subscribing to never miss another episode. As well as that, we'd like to thank our patrons, including our executive producers, Eustace Abel, Jeremy Marcoux, Tom McCool, and Tony Turin for helping to support the show. Thanks so much, and see you in the next episode.